Chapter Twenty Six of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Sage. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter Twenty Six. Well, when they was all gone, the king, he asks Mary Jane how they was off for spare rooms, and she said she had one spare room, which would do for Uncle William, and she'd give her own room to Uncle Harvey, which was a little bigger, and she would turn into the room with her sisters and sleep on a cot, and up garret was a little cubby with a pallet in it. The king said the cubby would do for his valley, meaning me. So Mary Jane took us up, and she showed them their rooms, which was plain but nice. She said she'd have her frocks and a lot of other traps took out of her room if they was in Uncle Harvey's way, but he said they weren't. The frocks was hung along the wall, and before them was a curtain made out of calico that hung down to the floor. There was an old hair trunk in one corner and a cadar box in another, and all sorts of little knick-knacks and jim-cracks around, like girls brisking up a room with. The king said it was all the more homely and more pleasanter for these fixins, and so don't disturb em. The duke's room was pretty small, but plenty good enough, and so was my cubby. That night they had a big supper, and all them men and women was there. I stood behind the king and the duke's chairs and waited on em, and the negroes waited on the rest. Mary Jane, she sat at the head of the table, with Susan alongside of her and said how bad the biscuits was, and how mean the preserves was, and how ornery and tough the fried chickens was, and all that kind of rot, the way women always do for to force out compliments. And the people all knowed everything was tip-top and said so, said, how do you get biscuits to brown so nice, and where for the land's sakes did you get these amazing pickles? and all that kind of humbug talky-talk, just the way people always does at a supper, you know. And when it was all done, me and the hare lip had supper in the kitchen off of the leavings, whilst the others was helping the negroes clean up things. The hare lip, she got to pumping me about England, and blessed if I didn't think the ice was getting mighty thin sometimes. She says, Did you ever see the king? Who, William Forth? Well, I bet I have. He goes to our church. I knowed he was dead years ago, but I never let on. So when I says he goes to our church, she says, What? Regular? Yes, regular. His pew's right over opposite Arn, on t'other side the pulpit. I thought he lived in London. Well, he does. Where would he live? But I thought you lived in Sheffield. I see I was up a stump. I had to let on to get choked with a chicken bone so as to get time to think how to get down again. Then I says, I mean he goes to our church regular when he's in Sheffield. That's only in the summer time when he comes there to take the sea baths. Why, how you talk? Sheffield ain't on the sea. Well, who said it was? Why, you did. I didn't, another. You did. I didn't. You did. I never said nothing of the kind. Well, what did you say, then? Said he come to take the sea baths. That's what I said. Well, then, how's he going to take the sea baths if it ain't on the sea? Looky here, I says. Did you ever see any Congress water? Yes. Well, did you have to go to Congress to get it? Why, no. Well, neither does William Forth have to go to the sea to get a sea bath. How does he get it, then? Gets it the way people down here gets Congress water, in barrels. There in the palace at Sheffield, they got furnaces, and he wants his water hot. They can't bile that amount of water away off there at the sea. They haven't got no conveniences for it. Oh, I see. You might have said that in the first place and saved time. When she said that, I see I was out of the woods again, and so I was comfortable and glad. Next, she says, do you go to church too? 
Yes, regular. Where do you sit? Why, in our pew. Whose pew? Why, Alan, your Uncle Harvey's. Hisn? What does he want with a pew? Wants to sit in it. What do you reckon he wants with it? Why, I thought he'd be in the pulpit. Rodham, I forget it was a preacher. I see I was up a stump again, so I played another chicken bone and got another think. Then I says, blame it, do you suppose there ain't but one preacher to a church? Why, what do they want with more? What, to preach before a king? I never did see such a girl as you. They don't have no less than seventeen. Seventeen, my land. Why, I wouldn't set out such a string as that, not if I never got the glory. It must take em a week. Shucks, they don't all of em preach the same day, only one of em. Well then, what does the rest of em do? Aw, oh, nothing much. Loll around, pass the plate, and one thing or another, but mainly they don't do nothing. Well then, what are they for? Well, they're for style. Don't you know nothing? Well, I don't want to know such foolishness as that. How is servants treated in England? Do they treat them better than we treat our Negroes? No, a servant ain't nobody there. They treat them worse than dogs. Don't they give them holidays the way we do? Christmas and New Year's week and Fourth of July? Oh, just listen. A body could tell you ain't never been to England by that. Why, Harry, why, Joanna? They never see a holiday from year's end to year's end. Never go to the circus, nor theater, nor negro shows, nor nowheres. Nor church, nor church. But you always went to church. Well, I was gone up again. I forgot I was the old man's servant. But next minute I whirled in on a kind of explanation how a valley was different from a common servant and had to go to church whether he wanted to or not and set with the family on account of its being the law. But I didn't do it pretty good. And when I got done, I see she weren't satisfied. She says, Honest Injun, now ain't you been telling me a lot of lies? Honest Injun, I says, none of it at all. None of it at all. Not a lie in it, says I. Lay your hand on this book and say it. I see it warn't nothing but a dictionary, so I laid my hand on it and said it. So then she looked a little bit of satisfied and says, Well then, I'll believe some of it, but I hope to gracious if I believe the rest. What is it you won't believe, Joe? says Mary Jane, stepping in with Susan behind her. It ain't right nor kind for you to talk so to him, and him a stranger, and so far from his people. How would you like to be treated so? That's always your way, Mame, always sailing in to help somebody before they're hurt. I ain't done nothing to him. He's told some stretches, I reckon, and I said I wouldn't allow it at all, and that's every bit and grain I did say. I reckon he can stand a little thing like that, can he? I don't care whether twas little or whether twas big. He's here in our house, and a stranger, and it wasn't good of you to say it. If you was in his place, it would make you feel ashamed, and so you oughtn't to say a thing to another person that will make them feel ashamed. Why, ma'am, he said, it don't make no difference what he said. That ain't the thing. The thing is for you to treat him kind and not be saying things to make him remember he ain't in his own country and amongst his own folks. I says to myself, this is a girl that I'm letting that old reptile rob of her money. Then Susan, she waltzed in. And if y'all believe me, she did give hair lip hawk from the tomb. Says I to myself, and this is another one? that I'm letting them rob of her money. Then Mary Jane, she took another inning and went in sweet and lovely again, which was her way. But when she got done, there weren't hardly anything left of poor Harelip. So she hollered. All right then, says the girl. You just ask his pardon. She done it too. And she done it beautiful. She done it so beautiful, it was good to hear. 
and I wished I could tell her a thousand lies so she could do it again. I says to myself, this is another one, and I'm letting them rob her of her money. And when she got through, they all just laid themselves out to make me feel at home, and I know I was amongst friends. I felt so ornery and low down and mean that I says to myself, my mind's made up. I'll hive that money for them or bust. So then I lit out for bed, I said, meaning some time or another. When I got by myself, I went to thinking the thing over. I says to myself, shall I go to the doctor private and blow on these frauds? No, that won't do. He might tell who told them. Then the king and the duke would make it warm for me. Shall I go private and tell Mary Jane? No, I dasn't do it. Her face would give them a hint, sure. They've got the money and they'd slide right out and get away with it. If she was to fetch in help, I'd get mixed up in the business before it was done with, I'd judge. Nope, there ain't no good way but one. I gotta steal that money somehow, and I gotta steal it some way that they won't suspicion that I done it. They got a good thing here, and they ain't a gonna leave till they've played this family and this town for all they're worth. So I'll find a chance time enough. I'll steal it and hide it. And by and by, when I'm away down the river, I'll write a letter and tell Mary Jane where it's hid. But I better hide it tonight if I can, because the doctor maybe hasn't lit up as much as he lets on he has. He might scare them out of here yet. So, thinks I, I'll go and search their rooms. Upstairs the hall was dark, but I found the Duke's room and started to paw around it with my hands. But I recollected it wouldn't be much like the king to let anybody else take care of that money but his own self. So then I went to his room and begun to paw around there. But I see I couldn't do nothing without a candle, and I dasn't light one of course. So I judged I'd got to do the other thing, lay for them and eavesdrop. About that time I hears their footsteps coming, and I was going to skip under the bed. I reached for it, but it wasn't where I thought it would be. But I touched the curtain that hid Mary Jane's frocks, so I jumped in behind that and snuggled in amongst the gowns and stood there perfectly still. They come in and shut the door, and the first thing the Duke done was to get down and look under the bed. Then I was glad I hadn't found the bed when I wanted it, and yet you know, it's kind of natural to hide under the bed when you're up to anything private. They sits down then, and the king says, Well, what is it? And cut it middling short, because it's better for us to be down there whooping up the morning than up here giving them a chance to talk us over. Well, this is it, Capit. I ain't easy. I ain't comfortable. That doctor lays on my mind. I wanted to know your plans. I've got a notion, and I think it's a sound one. What is it, Duke? That we better glide out of this before three in the morning and clip it down the river with what we've got, especially seeing we got it so easy, given back to us, flung at our heads, as you might say, when of course we allowed to have to steal it back. I'm for knocking off and lighting out. That made me feel pretty bad. About an hour or two ago it would have been a little different, but now it made me feel bad and disappointed. The king rips out and says, What? And not sell out the rest of the property? March off like a parcel of fools and leave eight or nine thousand dollars worth of property? Laying around just suffering to be scooped in? And all good, saleable stuff, too. The duke, he grumbled said the bag of gold was enough, and he didn't want to go no deeper, didn't want to rob a lot of orphans of everything they had. Why, how you talk, says the king. We shan't rob them of nothing at all but just this money. The people that buys the property is the sufferers, because as soon as it's found out that we didn't own it, which won't be long after we've slid, the sale won't be valid, and it's all go back to the estate. These yeah orphans'll get their house back, and that's enough for them. 
They're young and spry and can easy earn a living. They ain't going to suffer. Why, just think. There's thousands and thousands that ain't nigh so well off. Bless you. They ain't got nothing to complain of. Well, the king, he talked them blind. So at last he give in and said all right, but said he believed it was blame foolishness to stay and the doctor hanging over him. But the king says, cuss the doctor. What do we care for him? Hain't we got all the fools in town on our side? And ain't that a big enough majority in any town? So they got ready to go downstairs again. The duke says, I don't think we put the money in a good place. That cheered me up. I'd begun to think I wasn't going to get a hint of no kind to help me. The king says, why? Because Mary Jane will be in mourning from this out. And at first you know the negro that does up the rooms will get an order to box these duds up and put em away. And do you reckon a negro can run across money and not borrow some of it? Your head's level again, Duke, says the king. And he comes a-fumbling under the curtain, two or three foot from where I was. I stuck tight to the wall and kept mighty still, though quivery. And I wondered what them fellows would say to me if they catched me. And I tried to think what I'd better do if they did catch me. But the king, he got the bag before I could think more than about a half thought, and he never suspicioned I was around. They took and shoved the bag through a rip in the straw tick that was under the feather bed, and crammed it in about a foot or two amongst the straw, and said it was all right now, because a negro only makes up the feather bed and don't turn over the straw tick only about twice a year, and so it warn't in no danger of getting stole now. But I know better. I had it out of there before they was halfway downstairs. I groped along up to my cubby and hid it there till I could get a chance to do better. I judged I'd better hide it outside the house somewheres, cause if they missed it, they'd give the house a good ransacking. I know that very well. Then I turned in with my clothes all on, but I couldn't have gone to sleep if I'd have wanted to. I was in such a sweat to get through with the business. By and by I heard the king and the duke come up, so I rolled off my pallet and laid with my chin at the top of my ladder and waited to see if anything was going to happen, but nothing did. So I held on till all the late sounds had quit and the early ones hadn't begun yet, and then I slipped down the ladder. End of chapter 26. Recording by Bob Sage.